Hi everyone, my name is Edwig and today I'm going to be teaching you how to not go broke trying to invest in the stock market. Hi everyone and welcome to this week's episode of Don't Go Broke Trying. I am your host Rennie and if you are new here, maybe this is your first time listening because you saw you, you saw the title and you saw that you want to listen to this episode. This podcast is all about how to not go broke trying to live your best life. So today I have an extremely special episode. I love when I have other content creators on my platform, other finance content creators on my platform, because they just get it. You know, we, we, we teach similar things and I love sharing other people's perspectives because I know that I do not know everything. So today we're going to be talking about how to not go broke trying to invest in the stock market. This is a big topic. Y'all are always asking me about it. And honestly, a lot of times I just direct you to eduex page because i'm just like bruh like i can only share so much eduex knows more than me so let me share her page so i'm really excited to introduce you all to eduex brooks she is the goat the greatest of all time <laughs> and i can't wait for you to hear this episode so hi eduex hi Renny. thank you for having me how are you i'm well thank you good 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 i'm glad thank you so much for being here Thank you for having me. Do you want to introduce yourself to our audience? Hi, everyone. My name is Edwick. I am an engineer, financial educator, money uh, trauma of money certified coach, and the founder of Two Sides of a Dime, which is a financial literacy platform that is dedicated to making personal finance easy to digest and easy to implement. My goal is to break things down, but also give you actionable steps that you can implement today. Yes. And before you even continue listening to this episode, I want you to go and follow Eduek right now. Two sides of a dime. Yes. At two sides of a dime on all the platforms, right? Yes. Uh, so I'll make sure to leave those in the show notes. And if you like this type of content, please make sure you either subscribe if you're watching on YouTube or make sure you follow the podcast if you're watching on Spotify, listening on Spotify or on any other platform. Okay. So Eduek, again, I'm really excited for this conversation. I feel like I've been planning on having you on since the first season, yeah. but it just took a while, you know, <laughs> things, I was being things waiting for my invite. I was like, yeah. when am I getting that email? <laughs> oh, another thing, me and Eduek went and we were invited to meet the prime minister of yes. Canada. Yeah. So we got to go to the federal budget, budget reading, uh, back in March of 2023. Mm -hmm. And it was just a really cool opportunity. Yeah. So. It was, it was, it was such a, it was just great seeing, like when I saw your name in that email, right? I literally screamed. I was like, yes, <laughs> I know. Finally. I know. The fact that it was two black women, yeah. two black Canadian women. Nigerian women too. Like, talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was I was just so happy that the reason why I actually started Two Sides of a Dime, because coming here as an immigrant, I did not understand anything about the Canadian financial system. Yeah. And trying to read about it, I was not seeing anything from anyone that sounded like me, looked like me, talked like me. Yeah. It was just hard. So the fact that um, we we're getting that recognition for doing the job that we're the work that we're doing, it was just it was nice. Right. I was like when I got the email, I was like, wow, like me. I was just like, huh? <laughs> and then I was like, but if not us, then who, you know? Um, and when we went to the room that we went to like a room where I don't know. We were reading the budget and we were in mm -hmm. a vault actually. And then we looked outside at all the journalists and everyone yeah. who was there. And it was like, we're the only black woman in that room. needed some seasoning. Yeah. <laughs> Some spice in it, there. It, it needed some seasoning for real, but it was really cool. I was like, wow, like we're really doing this, yes. you know? So shout out to us and shout out to all of you for supporting our content. Because yes. honestly, you all help us um, and support our content, which makes us get all these opportunities. So thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, so Edward has a really amazing story going from being in debt to now mm -hmm. being financially free and on that journey of retiring early. So yes. I can't wait to share it all with all of you. So before we start, I always like to ask, what is your favorite thing right now? So we do the ready mm. rated segment, which is your favorite product, your favorite service, favorite song. What do you What are you loving right now? What am I loving right now? <laughs> <laughs> I did not have to think about this. What am I loving right now? It, it could be a product, a skincare product. I know you love skincare, so it could be yeah. a skincare product. It could be a song. It could be some food you just ate. What do you, What are you loving right now? No rush. Why did I not think about this? No Let rush. Me, give, me, give me a second. No rush. What am no I rush. loving right now? What am I loving? What am I loving? 
I'm actually really loving the reality TV on Netflix. Oh, me too. <laughs> I am like, that's just how I decompress after work. Me and too. these days, it's like back to back, all the reality shows. Um, I just recently watched the the Jewish matchmaking. Oh, is it, was it good? It was good. It was, <laughs> if you watch the Indian matchmaking, yeah. the woman, the matchmaker, she's the opposite of Sima Anti. Oh, really? <laughs> I need to watch she it. She actually gives the couples insight of how to have like a better relationship. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of what I've been loving. I nice. just love spending my time watching reality TV. Nice. It's like brain, honestly, I love it too. It's like, my brain is not required for this exactly. type of <laughs> Where's some like because I watch a lot of action um TV series, so it's yeah. like you have to like oh what follow. happened the other day like yeah you have to kind of follow like the whole storyline. Yeah. But where TV is just like it's vibes. Your brain is just shut down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so before we get into this, I just want to emphasize to everyone that this is not financial advice. This is just our personal opinion. But if you need one on one tailored advice, you should definitely reach out to either Eduek or your personal financial advisor. Or you can hit me up in the DMs if you would like to. Okay, so now let's get into it. We mm -hmm. want to know the real you. Okay, so okay. we always like to go all the way back to the beginning and okay. ask you about your childhood mm -hmm. and just learning more about where you came from. Because mm -hmm. someone's story, like if they were a trust fund baby, and then they are now at a hundred thousand dollar portfolio it's kind of like okay that's good but <laughs> cool you know, story bro yeah so we want to know where did you what was your first memory of money how was your relationship like with money growing up and how has it changed over the years um so i grew up okay so i i say i didn't come from like a poor family or lack it's just my parents always made sure like we had enough we mm -hmm. had like the best school education and things like that but we never had more than that. So okay. we never had like the fancy vacation, uh, the fancy trip clothes or like toys. And when I hear like people grew up with toys, I'm like, what's that? <laughs> I never knew what was what that was, but mm -hmm. we were well fed and taken care of. And because of that, whenever we wanted to do something, like if our friends were going on like a school trip or whatever, and I told my parents, there's always I always hear this, we don't have, there's no money. Mm. We don't have it. We don't have it. It was like we just had what we needed to get by. Mm -hmm. So it was never like that surplus. And this kind of actually was one of the things that formed my psyche when it came to money because I always told myself, like, I cannot wait to, like, start earning big money so that I can do all the things. Like, I never want to deny myself of anything. Yeah. That's why I was like... At first, I think I was trying to like be a doctor, and I was like, okay, this is not for me. And I was like, okay, <laughs> let's try the next best thing, an engineer, yeah. because I knew that was where the money was. So mm. I was like chasing after the money because I already had this idea of the lifestyle that I wanted to live. I was yeah. like, I'm going to do anything that I, I want to walk into a store <laughs> and just pick up that Prada handbag and just be like, here's my car. No, I don't looking care at the how price much it tag, is. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that kind of life. That's kind of what I've always envisioned. And looking back, and that was kind of the story of how I actually got into debt because when I started making my first big girl job or salary, I just started spending money. Mm. Like, yeah. <laughs> like there was no tomorrow. Buying whatever I wanted, I was like, oh, if it's a trip, get it. If it's this, get it. You deserve it. You've worked so hard. So it really shapes who we are with money. And this is something that I also like to do with people whenever I work with them is really understanding some of those um, cultural norms and how those shape us when we start to relate to money because we unconsciously do those things. Yeah. Right. Um, I have people that would say, oh, I would never live in an apartment because I want my my kids to have like uh, okay. to live in a, in a house and grow up there and have childhood memories. Mm -hmm. But maybe that was because you never had that growing up. Yeah. And that like we see people that end up buying houses that they cannot afford because they're trying to uh, do those <laughs> things that kind of like over um, uh, overcome those childhood childhood how do you say that word, childhood? Yeah. <laughs> childhood. Um, those things that they didn't have as kids growing up. Mm -hmm. So definitely that's one thing that I know shaped how I view and relate to money today. Yeah. And then I know from your story that you ended up about $47,000 in debt. Why do you so have to remind me? <laughs> 
it's a powerful part of your story yes. and i think it, it honestly gives you so much even more legitimacy to mm-hmm. say exactly what you're saying because it's like you've re- you've been through it right yeah. and you can advise people on how not to do how not to go broke okay yeah <laughs> so how did you get into debt and like what types of debt i know you said you were indulge overindulging but mm-hmm. what types of debt were these is it credit card debt student loans so it wasn't student loans i wish it was student loans and it would justify the, yeah. the debt <laughs> Um, so it was not, it was all consumer debt. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think half of that was not half, maybe, okay, let's, I already know these numbers. So I had three credit cards. One was around a thousand dollars. The other one was around another thousand dollars. I had another credit card that was like 15,000. That was where all the, Mm -hmm. all the shenanigans was happening. And then I had a line of credit that was around $10,000. And then my car loan was around $17,000. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, but how did you accumulate like this, say $15,000 debt? Mm -hmm. Like what, what was happening? Listen, (laughs) and you were making a good salary at the time, right? So, okay. This is, this is the problem, right? So when I first moved to Canada, right. From, uh, from, from Nigeria mm -hmm. as an international student. So I, I moved here to do my master's. So I was going to school and working multiple jobs and then when i graduated back then it's not now that it's easy for everyone back then we actually could not i could not get any reasonable engineering job if i didn't have a pr because that was the first question to ask you is do you have a permanent residency Uh, okay so i was doing multiple low-wage jobs i like was in all these temporary agencies and it just send you to like chicken factory and all these Mm -hmm. horrible jobs that I was doing. And it was just a lot of struggle for me. And I finally had a job where it was like, I had enough to like have a nice apartment. I could afford a car. I I was like, well, yes, (laughs) we are no longer going to struggle. Yeah, the struggle I've done. (laughs) So I was like, I spent a lot of money trying to get like this big ass condo that I had no business getting into, (laughs) but all the high end furniture, I was booking trips. I was living my best life. Yes. The problem is I was not looking at what was coming in and what was going out. So I was spending more than I was making. Mm, which a lot of people are guilty And of. that was just what got me into where I was. It wasn't really anything tangible for me. It was a lot of clothing. It was a lot of Sephora. It was a lot of traveling. There wasn't anything that I could look back and say, okay, this thing got me into debt. If I started a business... Then I'll be like, okay, this is what, how I got into that. Yeah. But most of the stuff that <laughs> it was so funny because when I when I started my debt free journey, I had to go back and look at all my bank statements. That was something I had to because like, I had to understand how I got here. And looking at these statements, I was just like, what? Like some of these things I couldn't even recognize. I was like, yeah. when did I go? When did there? I buy that? <laughs> is, is this fraud on my card? Like who's spending all this money? And then it's you. Some of these clothes, <laughs> I like they had gotten messed up in the washer. So they were already in the trash. Or oh, wow. I give them to Salvation Army. Like I was paying for stuff that I didn't even have anymore. Mm-hmm. So that's. That was like an eye-opening experience for me like yeah and i i really want everyone to like hear this and know that a lot of like a lot of people just because you're making a high salary Mm -hmm. it does not mean that you're retaining any of that money to be honest like a lot of high earners are actually in a lot of debt and again it's because maybe they're not tracking how much comes in each month and how much goes out so they're actually at a deficit month over month and especially in canada and the states we have a very credit-based economy Mm -hmm. and uh, in nigeria you may look at someone here and be like oh they're living luxuriously <laughs> they're living life but is it on their dime <laughs> is it, or is it on um, have the you credit paid card? for those clothes you're wearing yeah exactly <laughs> and uh, honestly okay when i was living when i was working minimum wage jobs i was actually better at managing my money mm. because i didn't know where the next rent money was going to come from so i had to really be careful with what i had at that time that makes sense. but then working a higher end salary job is because i know like in the next, next two weeks week. I know exactly how much is coming. So I always had that false sense of security where it's like, okay, even if I buy like stuff that I cannot afford, I'm going to pay it off next paycheck when I get paid. Yeah. But then something else comes up and then it accumulates. And before you know it, it's like, it just balloons into this big thing that you, that is out of control. If someone was in that situation, what would you tell them? Because I think like a lot of people, mm-hmm. yeah, they, they rely like, oh yeah, I'm going to get paid in two weeks, you know? Mm-hmm. But I think it's a pretty dangerous like philosophy to yes. have. So what would you tell somebody who may be, thinks that way currently you really have to have a sense of what's coming in and what's going out yeah. and a lot of people don't want to hear this <laughs> <laughs> the bad b word you really have to know what you're spending mm-hmm. and what and i'm not talking about tracking 
how much tomatoes and how much Starbucks, <laughs> but you really have to have a sense of this is how much income I'm making and this is how much I typically spend. Because if you don't put those numbers down, because for me, I thought, oh, well, because I always like, I felt like, oh, okay, at least I can pay my rent. I can pay my bills. So I thought I was good. I was yeah. doing good because I could, I could afford, I was never behind on any bills. Mm -hmm. So I thought I was doing good. But if you don't look at what you're spending and what you're making, you will never know. Even yeah. if just having that number, if you want to build wealth, do you know how much you have? Yeah, right? How what's, much do you have? What's your you net worth right that, now? Right? Your net worth could be negative right now. Mm -hmm. You don't even know. Yeah, that's very true. Okay, so you may need a budget, okay? Yeah, the, yeah. the budget. Yeah, the, the We call word. it a spending plan these days to yeah. make people feel I better. <laughs> I saw Ramit spending, <laughs> conscious spending. We call plan. it a spending plan these yeah. days just to make you feel good. Yeah, it's but a budget. I think it's a must. <laughs> Again, knowing what comes into your account each month, knowing what goes out, it may give you like a rude awakening. And mm -hmm. that's what you need to actually get on the right track. But if you're being willfully ignorant and you're like, I'm not going to look at what's in my account, it could end in tears. Yes, it really could. Like me. So I know that after accumulating all that debt you then decided i'm i'm on this debt-free journey mm -hmm. and you paid it off within 20 months yes. Forty seven thousand dollars in 20 yes. months is not easy yes. so <laughs> can you please tell us how you were able to get out of that i became aggressive i was determined to pay off that debt so this whole journey started for me i was just i was i think i was 28 about to be i was like okay you know that coming to Jesus moment. I had just gone on a trip to Greece. I was on this long flight back home. And I was just, I had, me and my friend were doing this thing where it's like 30 things you have to do before you turn 30. Mm. And so I was writing on my list. And I was just like, listen, girl, like, why are you writing all these things down when you don't even have money in your bank account? Ooh. And I just come back from this trip and I knew like, I literally had to wait till I was going to get paid before I would have money to do anything. Mm. And I was just thinking about it. I was like, you are in a position where you're really very successful in your career you are living your dream life basically you're doing your dream job you have that dream apartment like everything that i wanted i had in that moment and i was just like but you have nothing else to show for it yeah if people called me back home and was like oh i need like money 500 i was like i don't have it i don't have it i don't have it mm. and, and for me i've always wanted to be in that space where i could be generous towards other people like i had something and i was just like okay now you need to get your life together and for me, when it comes to money, I've always known the theory behind it because I read a lot of books. So I know what to do, but I just never executed it. Wait. And there were several times when I was like, oh, I'm going to pay off debt. And I maybe paid off on credit card, <laughs> but then I went back into the cycle. Yeah. But and then I came back from that from that trip and I tallied my debt. <laughs> That's when I found that I was 47 because in my head it was like 20 something. Oh, wow. And then when I looked at it, I was like, oh, wow. Yeah. This is how much we owe. And so I was like, okay, you need to pay this off because if something happened, uh, like, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And then my worst nightmare happened just two weeks after I had made that plan. I walked into work and they were like, I don't know, maybe my, I feel like my employers felt like this girl doesn't need this job. She's just always on a trip somewhere. Oh my God. <laughs> I got laid off that, that day oh, wow. and I was just like, wow, $47,000 in debt, no savings, very minimal money that I had been sporadically investing. I was just like, what you going to do now? So that was like that point of no return for me. It was like, I cannot be in this position where it's just like, this is happening to me. And mm -hmm. then I became very aggressive with it. I started applying for jobs. I think I got a job, but I was supposed to start in January. So I still had like two months in between. So I was driving Uber. I was doing everything. I was hustling. I was like, whatever mm -hmm. I can to pay this debt off. And that's what I did because yeah. I was just like, I need to get to the position where I'm no longer unstable. I need that financial security because at the end of the day, it was, it was just me. Like I have nobody. It was just me in Canada. Yeah. No family. Like, the family that I had was actually depending on me. So I was like, yeah. who are you going to turn to if you become, God forbid, you cannot afford rent? I didn't have anybody's basement to go crash at, yeah. anybody's house. So I was just like, if something happens to you, you're royally screwed. Yeah. So you need to <laughs> figure it out. So that's kind of what led me on that path of just attacking the debt yeah i like what you mentioned about how you read a lot of books and you knew what <laughs> you needed to do but you were like no nah, like you know you you hear but you don't do and exactly. i think a lot of people are guilty of this and if you're listening to this podcast and you're in debt and you're not going to do anything after this i'm talking <laughs> to you uh but i i really want everyone to know that it's one thing to hear the words it's one thing to read the books it's one thing to do all that but faith without 
action. What is it? Without works, Wait, is, without dead. works is dead. Yeah. So I need you to actually put in the work to mm-hmm. actually get to where you want. Um, and I know I sound like I'm dragging you. I kind of am. So I hope this <laughs> serves as a, hum, a a nice drag for you. Yeah. But can you share some practical tips about how you actually got out of this debt? So mm-hmm. I know you said you started driving Uber, but mm-hmm. what, any, like the first thing, you, the first thing you did was you laid out all the debt on the table. And yeah. You, so what are so some practical tips? Going back and looking at those statements because I needed to know how I got to where I was mm. and it's just you and yourself so you really have to be true to yourself how did I get to this debt is it because of my bad spending habits because I was not paying attention you have to ask yourself and then going back to what we talked about like those unconscious biases that form how we were for me I, I realized that it was this need for me to feel like I've arrived mm. I'm finally that big girl doing my thing successful that was the image that I wanted people to see yeah. so I had to kind of live up to that and for me I had to be real with myself and be like okay you cannot keep this up it's like who are you like if people think you're successful on the outside but on the inside it's like nothing then who are you who are you like who, 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 who whose benefit is this for yeah so i really just going back and doing that analysis of that self-reflection of what happened and then the next thing i had to find out from me is what are the things that trigger me to spend because there are certain times that i'm pretty good with my money i'll save mm-hmm. i'll have like money in my savings account and then after a period of time it's just like withdrawals <laughs> yes <laughs> constant withdrawals like why like what are the things that typically make you spend and for me one of those things is stress mm. whenever you feel stressed out you feel burnt out you find this need to want to self suit yeah and for a lot of people especially women we will tend to look to whatever is that thing that is our that comfort for us for me, I am a homebody. I'm an introvert, so I like to be at home. So I like to have a really nice apartment. So whatever it's there, the first thing I'm looking at is I want to redecorate. Like mm. I want to, I want to feel more cozy and more peaceful. I want to come back from work and feel like that is my safe haven. Yeah. So it becomes endless trips to home sense. It's like, why do you need to change the color of your kitchen again? Yeah. Like last last summer it was red. Like this summer is white. Next summer is like, so that's, that's the, that's the p- pattern that I typically go into. I like um, anything self-care. I like my face mask. I like my candles. Mm-hmm. All of those things were things that I would typically do whenever I'm feeling stressed out because I felt like those things would make me feel no longer stressed. But I started to realize that those things were temporary. Like, Mm. yeah, you feel good in the moment. But then when I look at my bank account and it's like overdrawn, it's like I go back and feel bad all over again. Yeah. So it's really asking myself, what are the other things that I can do to replace that feeling? And sometimes it might just be taking more rest. It could be um, I like to journal a lot journaling your thoughts exercising like some of these things are things that we know we already know these yeah. things. Like, none of this stuff that i'm telling you is new mm-hmm. but really practicing it like for me like a lot of times it's like the willpower to get to the gym is hard but as soon as you do that exercise you're like oh my gosh i feel so much better Facts. even talking to a friend like i had like a friend that like held me accountable mm. so sometimes i'm like oh my gosh i want to go buy stuff and she's like girl don't do it yeah girl don't do it yeah. so you really have having goals, someone right? to hold you accountable is also another really helpful thing. And then, so once I had that, the psychology kind of figured out, now I became very self-aware when things were happening because it's not like that it's going to stop. Like, you will try your best to be like, okay, I'm never going to do this again, but mm, it's not going to happen. Yeah, <laughs> You just need to know how to handle that when it happens moving forward. And then the second thing that I did was I stopped using all credit. Okay, And I know this is like very, very... Controversial. Um, cold turkey and I try so hard to get people to do this even clients I work at no one wants to do it everyone loves their credit card it's yeah. like it's like a god to people and they worship this thing so much and it's the thing that is putting you into so much financial strain and stress it's the credit card points it's the all the I canceled, not canceled, but I cut it up Mm -hmm. and I stopped using it because I knew that that was the thing that was getting me into debt. And if you rely so much on gold power, going back to the things that trigger you, when you're stressed out, you don't have that that strong gold power anymore because you're, you're in that you're in a very vulnerable, vulnerable. position. Mm-hmm. So now you have to put controls in place that will help you when you're in that state. Because there are Smart. times where you do really well during the month and then there's that one week where it's just everything just <laughs> goes south. Yeah. So now if I I stopped using cards and another thing that I did was I was only using cash for um, variable expenses. Okay. So things that I know I typically overspend in, things like shopping, I know those were my weaknesses. So now if like I'm walking into Zara, 
I have like a hundred dollars because this happens all the time. Like you walk into Zara, maybe you have like a birthday coming up. You walk in there, you see like the perfect dress. Mm -hmm. Perfect. It has everything that you wanted. It's hitting all the curves where it's supposed (laughs) to hit. And you look at the price tag and it's 120, but you only had a hundred dollars. What are you going to do? gonna spend it you're on gonna your buy credit it card, yeah. you're gonna put it on the credit card because mm-hmm. you're gonna be like it's only $20 yeah that's but, the mentality you have mm-hmm. it's only $20 and then the next time you go buy a, a pair of shoes and it's like five dollars extra it's only five dollars yeah. you go buy groceries it's a, a little fifty dollars oh, it's only fifty dollars yeah. throw it on a credit card but that Facts. accumulates and yeah. before you know it it's more than you made that month Facts. so for me putting that restriction on myself only having that cash on hand I know okay I budgeted a hundred dollars for clothing this month i walk into zara i see that really nice dress and i'm like hmm. <laughs> it's either i have to wait till next month when i have 200 dollars because every month i budget 100 dollars, or i have to find something else that fits within that budget so yeah. that's kind of what i started doing and then with the debt itself just i kind of focus on whatever was annoying me i call it the debt tornado method okay my students know this Okay, um, so but, I, so can you explain that to yeah. everyone? So the the debt tornado is kind of focusing on the debt that annoys you the most. Okay. And going back to the emotions that are tied to debt, especially your background and where you're from. I know where, where we're from. Debt is like a very bad thing. Like it's something that you keep a secret. You don't even share it because there's a lot of shame mm-hmm. and guilt behind it. So for me, it's like focusing on what do I need to get? What do I need to what do I need to pay off now so that it's not affecting me mentally because, Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I can make rational decisions and also looking at what makes sense in terms of, is it a high balance or is it a high interest? Mm. So for me, one of the things that I wanted to pay off was a personal loan. So I owed a couple friends. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Jesus. So for me, it was like, these are people that I speak to regularly and I cannot be like, Oh, I'm paying off. I paid off $2,000 on this credit card. And my friend is like, you own me. Girl, where's my money? Yeah. <laughs> so for me to preserve that friendship, that was the first thing that I had to go. Even though it was a zero interest, people would tell you, wait till the end. Mm-hmm. But I was like, no, like I had to pay my friend. And I like this uh, approach because I think oftentimes it's like, oh, you must do the debt avalanche mm-hmm. method or you must do the debt snowball. And it's like, no, there are other ways that you can approach it. So I like yeah. the, this one because, so f- yeah, some debt is annoying, like more annoying than others, even though it may be a low interest or it's just like about preserving the friendship, as you yeah. said. Yeah, and, and it was a combination of all three methods and what made sense at that time. And then the next one for me was like a store credit card. I actually used it to buy a camera that I used on my trip to Gris. <laughs> and that interest period was going to end in six months. So that made logical sense. Okay, pay that one next. Yeah. And then the other thing was my overdraft. And mm. even though I was at that stage where I was like, okay, I'm paying off debt, I was still, every time I get um, paid and I pay all the bills and pay my extra payments to debt and all that stuff, I was getting overdrawn. Okay. So seeing that negative balance was just affecting me mentally. I was like, okay, that needs to go. Mm -hmm. Even though that was like a lower interest, I could have waited till the very end, but I was like, okay, this needs to go next. Yeah. And then the next thing was my credit card. So I had my credit card, which was 15K, but the line of credit was 10,000. So it would have made sense to pay the line of credit first, but I was like, okay, this credit card needs to go because this is like where all the evidence is. Yeah. (laughs) Of all (laughs) All the Zara purchases. spending. So I was like, okay, that needs to go next. So that's kind of what motivated me to keep going Mm -hmm. and the other thing which is i think is the most important part is accountability Mm -hmm. just having someone to hold you accountable i started um back then i started a podcast to talk about my debt-free journey with my friend because she was paying off debt back then as well and just hearing people and then i started an instagram page and started sharing my numbers every month and then at first i was anonymous because i was like yeah i was just randomly talking to the ether and like i only had like 200 followers so i was just like and then people started following me i was like yeah. okay it's inspiring and then i don't know how at first i was like blocking all my friends i didn't want anyone to know <laughs> oh my god <laughs> and then people just started finding me and yeah. then dming me and saying oh my god your journey is so inspiring and blah 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 and I was like, okay, I guess we have to keep this up because <laughs> now I people are watching. I really love it. So that was really one of the things that helped me keep going. It was that accountability. And did you also reward? Like, was there any type of reward in this? Because I know that's something that's kind of important on the Yeah, celebrating your wins. Yeah. I had like this thermometer on my fridge that I was tracking every 5% that I pay off. I'll kind of color it in. Yeah. And I was like doing that in my stories. It's still in my stories. It's story like a highlight. dopamine st- hit, right? It's like, and I'm oh, a very, at- like, I, I'm a very, very, like, I like tracking my goals. I like, I like seeing how things are going. Yeah. So I think I, I had like different milestones. I think when I got to 25%, it's like, okay. And then, oh, I forgot to mention, 
I stopped buying clothing for like two years. Oh wow! So that was another big like. And you had enough, right? You did listen, have enough. I had things with tags on that, <laughs> I, that I'd never even worn. Yeah. But I stopped buying clothing for two. Uh, that was a, a huge thing that helped me save money. Mm-hmm. And so I think that every like I was like okay when you're this amount of percent, this is what you can do for yourself. Because there's a lot of things I had to like cut back on. Yeah. So like introducing those things slowly back into my budget was like kind of like a small reward. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And then another thing that I also forgot to mention was when I, losing my job at that time, I think it was just, it was just God that it was just God sent because then I had figured out exactly how much I needed to earn in order to be debt free. Mm-hmm. So my initial goal was 36 months and I knew that in order for me to be debt free I needed to make an extra 1300 in order to do that. So I calculated how much I needed in terms of what I needed to pay for rent, my budget and all of that. And then I was like this is the target salary that I need for any job that I'm looking for and that is exactly what I got. It was like I I was like $1000 more <laughs> than what I had initially written on my paper. So being very specific in those types of goals and then that extra money, I was just throwing it towards my debt. Mm-hmm. I worked a lot of overtime. I didn't really do side hustles because my job was already very stressful. So I was like, there's no way I'm doing a side hustle. I did Uber sporadically, but I stopped like after like a few months. Yeah. But a lot of it was just overtime. So whenever I made money over time, I would just throw it into Your debt. my debt. Nice. Okay. I really love how in how detailed you were. And these are actual practical tips that mm-hmm. people can take away. Like I think I feel like a lot of people are just like, Yeah, you know, I paid off my debt and you know, I just put I paid money towards it. But it's like I think that you started with the psychology behind it before getting into actual things. So just for me to recap all of this and there are lots of information about this on her story um first she started off with a mindset shift like Mm -hmm. actually understanding why do i spend the way that i spend then you laid it all out all of your debt on the table and all your target income in order to pay off that debt and i guess you created a plan on how you would do it Mm -hmm. then you picked up like uber just to get through and like make some extra income while Mm -hmm. you you needed it then you identified what your spending triggers are so what are the things that are really causing you to spend i think that's an important part that a lot of people miss Mm -hmm. like yeah you know that you're in debt but why again we're not always going to be like on that that um we know, motivation is very fleeting right mm-hmm. but discipline is everything and if you yeah. can put controls in place which is what you did after yeah. then you can actually stick to the goals that you set then you did something which was only using cash which i think a lot of people will find it very hard to do it's always controversial whenever i say yeah this. <laughs> even me I, I haven't used cash in like year. i'd never use cash so that's really i that's admirable actually mm-hmm. then you stopped buying clothing and you l- went into the debt tornado method which mm-hmm. again i will link it on her page um i'll make sure to leave it down below and then you had an accountability partner and i think uh, one of the most important parts you had when you were tracking your wins and you mm-hmm. rewarded yourself once uh it, every five percent of your goal yeah. so yeah thank you for sharing that what are some of the mistakes that you made along the way as you were paying mm-hmm. off your debt were there any mistakes that you made i think one of my biggest mistakes is i wouldn't really say a mistake because i don't regret it but um, going back, it's if I would have done it differently, that's what I would have done is, again, going back to how debt affected me. For me, it was just a lot of shame and guilt. And I really wanted it gone so bad that I don't think I was making the best decision. So one of the things mm. that I stopped doing then was um, investing. Uh. So I was like, I invested at, like I invested lump sums whenever I get like my tax refund or bonuses, but I wish that I continued investing as I was paying off debt because I was putting like $2,000 towards this debt. So it wasn't like a small amount of money. So I could afford to do both. Yeah. Even if it would have taken me, Longest because I already planned 36 months, but I did it in 20. So I could have just done it in 36 mm. and still had some money. Um, and then another thing that I did, <laughs> I was so mad at my credit card that I can't, it uh, which was my oldest credit card and i lost i my credit my score dropped 140 points oh wow after i paid up my debt and closed everything i was like yeah. i was just calling people you know like that feeling i was like yeah i've paid up my debt close it <laughs> in your face sucker. period but i wish i had kept that oldest card open mm-hmm. i don't know if i wish i kept it open because i just had a really i just had a lot of emotional things with it Attachment. even though i did close it it still came back up 
after a few months, my, cre- my credit score that is. Yeah. But looking back, those are the two things I feel like I would have just done differently. Mm-hmm. And I know on your page, you said that you were making extra payments towards like your l- debt, but you didn't mm-hmm. clarify with the company if it was going towards your principal or your interest, right? So. Oh, yeah. The only the only thing that I had an issue with was my car. Yeah. So with um, so there are two types of debt. There's fixed and then there's revolving. Mm-hmm. So with the with the revolving, when you're paying it off, when you make that extra payment, they take whatever the interest is and the rest goes to the principal Mm -hmm. so things like your credit card your line of credit there's no issue but when it's a fixed loan like a personal loan or like a um what's it called like something like a student loan or a car Car loan loan. even mortgage yeah Yeah. you have to specify whenever you're making extra payment because at first i didn't know so whenever i make extra payments they thought i was pre because i was on a bi-weekly schedule so they thought i was prepaying my my bi-weekly payments so I made the first payment and then I was supposed to get charged, let's say, on the 15th. Nothing came out. And then the next <laughs> pay second, nothing came out. I was like, what's happening? Because uh, I still wanted the minimum payments to come out, but I was just making extra payments. Yeah. So I had to call them and they're like, oh, you have to specify that is going to the principal. They're so annoying with that. And it's kind of annoying because back then, I think the first few months that I was doing it, they didn't have it online the way you can do it. And then after a while, I think they changed the system where now you could you could go online and then actually say, oh, this payment mm. should go to principal. So if you're making any extra payment without student loans, your mortgage, your car loan, if it's a fixed loan, you have to call them and say, hey, these extra payments need to go towards the principal. Yeah. Unless they'll just say maybe you're prepaying your mortgage by one year and then they won't yeah. take any money from your bank account. So I hope everyone understands that. Yeah. Like <laughs> you need to call up your company and tell them exactly where you want the money to go. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they uh, for some reason they just assume I don't know why they assume <laughs> that. But okay. I guess people do that, so I don't but know. But why? What like I, I would rather pay down the the principal. The principal. Okay. So now we've gone through your debt free journey and now you are on track to build a investment portfolio that will help you retire in your yes. 40s so are you would you say you're on the fire journey so i am in the i call it financial independence do whatever you want okay so for everyone fire is fi- financial independence retire, retire early. early so anyway it calls it financial independence <laughs> live your best life <laughs> For okay. me, it's just having that option to either work a job or not work a job. Mm. Because a lot of people, they are so afraid of this thing called retirement, where it's like, if I retire at 45, what, what do I do I with my do? life for the next 60? Like, you can do other things, but you don't have to clock in. Yeah. I don't have to take clients if I don't want to. I don't have to do any of that thing because I know I have constant income coming from somewhere else mm. where I don't have to work. I don't know. People always say, I don't see myself not working. Retire. It's like, yeah. I see myself not working. <laughs> I'm very I, I don't dream of labor. No, I do, thank you. I do not dream of a life where I have to work for yeah. the rest of my life. I always say that I want to work optional life, right? Yes. So it's like, yeah, if I want to work, sure. Because I like working for me. Well, like the kind of work I'm doing now, like mm-hmm. educating people, I really enjoy it, exactly. right? So, but if you know, if I have the option not to work, obviously, like exactly. I should be able to ex- exercise that. Live your baby girl life. So that's the journey you're on to yes. have a live your best life type life Mm -hmm. okay i love it and how did you start with investing in the stock market like where did where did you start with that oops so it's actually a funny story too (laughs) so my investing journey started with that first job that i had my first big gold job i had everything i had a company phone they had something where they were like they say they're gonna put money into your retirement and again i had read a lot of books but all of these books were American specific. Yeah. So I remember when I was signing my contract, I remember the woman saying something like that. And I was like, oh yeah, so yeah, you guys have a 401k here. And she was like, baby, no, we don't have a <laughs> we're not in America. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an RSP. I was like, what? <laughs> okay. I've never heard that before. Because yeah. all the books I had read had talked about 401k. So I thought we had 401k in Canada because Canadian <laughs> system and the American system were a lot similar, right? Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, so I just put that at the back of my mind. Obviously, I didn't do anything that day. I didn't um, start the RSP plan because I was trying to live my best life. Yeah. And then I've- I think a few months after, I was like, okay, maybe we should consider doing this thing. Because I was listening, to, I was a podcast I listened to almost every uh, morning as I was driving to work, and they always talked about like retirement plan. I was like, hey, let me try and do this. Mm-hmm. So I walked into the office again. I was like, oh, I want to start investing. I want to start contributing to this RSP thing. And so she explained, okay, this is, we'll take 
uh, money from your paycheck and then we'll match a certain percentage. All of that was just going over my head. I didn't know what she was talking about. And then she handed me this fat brochure. Mm-hmm. I was like, choose your investments. And I went, I remember going back home and it was just like looking at all these numbers and letters. I was like, what is this? Mm-hmm. It was so confusing to me. And what was even more annoying was that there was nobody in my life, no one in my circle that I could call and ask, yeah. what do I do? That's why our work is really powerful, right? Because they can go to you or I me I tried now. to Google it. I could not find anything. There was literally zero information out there. Mm-hmm. But what I had remembered, there was a podcast that the podcast I had listened to talked about Target Date Fund. This was like a U.S. podcast. Mm-hmm. I remember them saying that go to, like, choose the year you're going to retire because Target Date Funds, they end in a specific year. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, let's do that. And then they were ask, asking about percentages. I was just, I literally did random, I just <laughs> picked random boxes. Yeah. I had no clue what I was doing. Mm-hmm. But that actually awakened something in me because I don't like not knowing what I'm doing. I'm always someone that I always have a plan. I have a goal. I mm-hmm. know exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, you need to learn this more. And that's kind of where I started learning um, I think back then all I was hearing about was like mutual funds, like, okay, what's mutual funds? And then I started reading about mutual funds and they're like, oh, mutual funds are bad. You need to go to index funds. I was like, okay. <laughs> so that's kind of how I started learning. I was just like, oh, this is very interesting. Yeah. And that's how, how you guys started. Investing. started. <laughs> well, that's good. I feel like, um, the difference between you and a lot of people is a lot of people would see RRSP and then they're like, I don't know what that is. I'm not doing it. Mm-hmm. Right. But instead you were like, Oh, I'm kind of curious. Let me learn exactly. more. Um, so I'm glad that you did. And then how, how did it, it just started growing for you? Were you checking it regularly? How was, how was that? No, even when I started, cause I, I started with my company RSP. So I picked my investments and then I received like the statement every year. And I was like, I think, okay, the first year I received it, I saw that I made like $300 or something in a year. Mm -hmm. Stupid mutual fund, but whatever. (laughs) (laughs) But I was like, wait a minute. (laughs) You mean I could just put money into something and and I'll just make money? And grows more than your savings account, I was like, oh, wow, we can do this. (laughs) And so that's kind of where I was like, okay, now I need to actually pay attention to this. And Mm. I started learning more about it. Actually, to take you back... My journey actually started before that. I think the previous company that I worked with, I did something similar. It was like a Canadian savings bond. They don't have it anymore. Mm -hmm. I was actually putting $50 towards that. And that money, I think after two years, that was what I actually used to quit that job. Oh, wow. So I already, I was like, okay. But for me, I saw it more of like a savings thing. I didn't see it as investing. But going back and like, I was like, that's actually a bond that you bought. Like you were actually investing. Mm -hmm. But... I already knew the power of like having money set aside. Yeah. So when I saw that extra three hundred dollars, I was like, okay, you need to you need to pay attention to this. Yeah. And then listening to um watching YouTube videos and seeing people that are like, I made like twenty percent. I'm like, I, I want, that's what I want to learn. How, why do I do that one? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's the one I want to learn. <laughs> so then, how did you transition from like this? Oh, and for everyone who doesn't know, RSP is Registered Retirement Savings Plan. It's the way that we invest for our retirement here in, or save or invest for our retirement here in Canada. I think you should invest for your retirement rather than save for yes. it. Uh, yeah, but I think it's one of the most low effort ways to actually start investing mm-hmm. because someone else is doing it on your behalf and your employer is matching your um, contributions typically. So that is always good. You know, it's like yeah. free money that they're giving you and your work there. They should be paying you as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, okay. So after that, how did you get into self-directed investing from there it was just a lot of learning a lot of learning um just reading books on this i would i became very curious like i read so many books Mm -hmm. and not finding anything canadian specific and still trying to like see how i can how i can take what i've learned and uh, apply that to like the canadian side of things Mm so i think um so what had happened was that job that I got laid off from, that was, um, so I had to move my money into like a self-directed plan. And then it was mm. like, what are you going to do with the money now? So yeah. I had to learn. I was like, okay, this is how you do your asset allocation. This is how you start investing. So that was kind of how I really started. Like, I mean, on the side, I was like occasionally trying something, but now I was like, okay, now you have to be serious. Cause it was like a lump sum of money. So I was yeah. like, okay, how do you manage these funds? And then I was like, okay, I finally opened like a self-directed RSP and then I started putting money in there and going forward from there. Nice. And let's, let's assume that everybody who's listening here has no idea about investing. Mm -hmm. Where would you tell everybody where in Canada uh, to start? Like if they want to start investing right now, like where would you tell them to start? 
So there is something <laughs> called an ETF mm -hmm. or an index fund. So basically it is a fund that contains all of the best companies within, whether that's a country, whether that's a sector, um, they're all contained inside this fund. Because one of the things that a lot of people have difficulty is knowing what to invest in. Yeah. You know that a company is great, but there are 20, 50, 100, a million other good companies. So how do you ex know exactly which one to choose? Mm -hmm. And a lot of investors get into this analysis paralysis where you're like trying to figure out what's the best. So rather than choosing or trying to figure out who's going to be the best, why not just invest in all of them at the same time? So basically an index fund or an ETF is a fund that contains all of those great companies inside of one. Mm -hmm. One of the most common index funds that we hear about is the S&P 500 index fund. And what it is, it's 509 of the top companies in the US. So you have your Netflix, your Amazon, your Meta, your Microsoft. Apple, mm -hmm. Visa, Microsoft, all of these great companies that you probably use and you love, you know that these companies make money because these are trillion dollar businesses mm -hmm. and you get to own part of it inside of that fund. And one of the things that that index fund will do for you is that, let's say, for example, you bought Netflix. I don't know why you did that. In 2020, <laughs> you would have lost a lot of money by now and I don't feel sorry for you. But if you had Netflix and four, 508 other companies, even though one company didn't do well, some of the other companies will kind of make up for it. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things you learn when you start investing is that diversification. Not only do you have several companies, you have several companies in different sectors yeah. because different sectors def perform differently, especially during certain economic cycle. For example, last year, the stock market was performing wonders and a lot of people were crying <laughs> because people were so heavy in technology. Yeah. But what happens is when there is something like a recession or when there's uncertainty in the economy, people stop to spend money. Plus inflation was hidden or behind. So people were, didn't have money as much to spend on luxury items like they would have usually done. Mm -hmm. And all of these co tech companies are luxury goods. Yep. So people were not buying their latest iPhones like they would usually do because they just... Don't they're trying to the like fund. build their emergency fund. They're yeah. trying to pay off debt. They're trying to do other things with their money. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that these companies' sales start to decline and investors lose confidence. So they start to take off their shares and the stock price starts to decline. So what you want to do is you want to look, you want to have a diversified portfolio where it's like, okay, yes, you have a little bit of tech, but what are certain industries that will actually do well when there is an economic decline? And one of the things that that index fund will do for you is that it has several industries. So there's healthcare. A lot of times, even when there's a recession, people still need healthcare. People still need to go to the hospital. Always. People still need food. So there's the consumer discretionary inside of there. Um, so you have all of these different industries inside of that one fund. And then you notice that even if the stock market declines, the loss that you have on one stock will be so much more than the loss you have on like your index fund or ETF. Mm -hmm. That's one of the most important things of having an index fund and ETF is that diversification that it gives you. So if someone wants to buy an ETF, an exchange traded fund, how would they do that? Like, is it, where do we go? Do we go to the store and buy it? Like how, how does that work? So there is um, something called a brokerage. So a brokerage is more like a middleman. So they act as a middleman between you, the investor and the company. So companies um, sell their shares on something called the stock market. So uh, I usually use the analogy of a flea market. If you went into the flea market, the, the people that own the flea market, all of these vendors have to go and register their stalls. Like I want to sell tomatoes, I want to sell strawberries, I want to sell apples, I want to sell oranges. All of these different um, vendors will go to the flea market customer service and registered companies. So this, the customer service is the stock market because any company that wants to sell their shares needs to go through the stock market. Mm -hmm. And then you, as the, the person that is coming to buy stuff, if you wanted to buy it, you have to go through that vendor, right? You have to go through the person, the kind of like the middleman. So the middleman is like the flea market itself is the store. Like, where do you go to if you wanted to buy something? Mm -hmm. You can't just walk into Apple's store and be like, give me some shares. Yeah. You have to go through a, a middleman that will broker that sale for you. Yeah. So you tell them, hey, I want to buy three shares. I want to buy five shares. And then you give, they tell you what the price is at that time. 
and then you buy it and then they give you your shares. Yeah, exactly. I don't think that was a great uh, explanation. And yeah, uh, some examples if you're in Canada would be like TD Direct, any of the banks, basically, they yeah. have their own investing platforms. I will say the banks are typically a bit more expensive. Yes. They have not a bit more, a lot, a lot, yeah, a lot more expensive <laughs> than than these like other financial institutions. Uh, but any uh, if a lot of people just like to stay with their banks, honestly. Mm -hmm. So if you if that's you, then Go to your bank, ask them for a self-directed tax-free savings account or a self-directed RRSP. If it's for your child, self-directed RESP. There are so many ways, but I find that like when you go to the bank and you're like, hey, I want to open my TFSA or my RRSP, they're like, okay, here's a mutual fund to put you in, right? And can you tell us what a mutual fund is and why maybe we don't want to? Yeah, <laughs> so them? a mutual fund is similar to what I talked about with index funds and ETFs. It's still... A fund manager will package all of these great companies and put them into a fund. Mm -hmm. Now, the difference between a mutual fund and something like an index fund and ETF is that with a mutual fund, the they usually have a goal. So the goal of the mutual fund is they have a, an index which they're tracking and they want to beat that index. Whereas an index fund or ETF, they're just trying to mirror what that index is doing. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to the example of the S&P 500. If the S&P 500 made 20% in 2020, that mutual fund will, le will be looking to beat that 20%. Whereas an index fund is looking to just do Match. 20%, do mm -hmm. exactly what the index did. And because the mutual fund, because they are trying to actively beat that benchmark, there's a lot of buying and selling that happens inside of the fund. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot active. And if you, whenever you sell um, an investment or whenever you purchase, there's fees that come with it. There's taxes that come with mm -hmm. that. And that drives up the operating cost of that fund, which is called the management expense ratio. Mm -hmm. And that gets passed on to you yep. as the investor. <laughs> you have to pay that. And the management expense ratio is a percentage of your entire portfolio. So let's say the management fee is 1% and you have $1,000. Every single month, you're getting charged 1,000, oh, sorry, 1% 1 of that $1,000. Mm -hmm. So over time, imagine what that would look like if you are living your investment for like 20 years, 30 years, and you have like a million dollar portfolio and that... 1% is going to cost you a lot of money. It eats into your profit significantly. Yeah. So, and then with an index fund, because it's more, they're not trying to do the most. They're not trying to do <laughs> what the mutual funds are doing. So basically they just buy all the companies and they just leave it alone. They do more of a study than forget it. Yes, they have to manage it. Maybe they have a schedule where they do it quarterly, or maybe they even have automated um, systems that do all of that for them. So there's not a lot of active buying and selling, and that reduces the cost, the management expense ratio. So typically an index fund or ETF would be around zero point, maybe zero one percent, zero point zero five, whereas a mutual fund would typically be from one percent and above. Mm. So that's the major difference. Yeah. And, um, it, it can really cut into, I know 1% doesn't seem like a lot, uh, but it can really cut into your profit long yeah, term. It, it Especially will. if you have a lot of money in there, even no matter what amount of money, like 1% still is significant. Mm -hmm. And say you're, say, and because they're so, they're actively managing it, I feel like they rarely beat the market. Yes. You know, like they're struggling. Only, <laughs> they say 80% of active managers do not beat the market. Yeah. So I would rather put my money in someone who's just trying to match the market. Mm -hmm. They're passively managing, they're setting it and forgetting it. Yeah. That's what I prefer to do but always make sure you look at those expense ratios to make sure how much are they actually charging me for this and I actually meet with a lot of people who have mutual funds because you know that's what the banks push on mm -hmm. them and then they just like they they they've never checked how the growth is doing and then when we check together they're actually they've been losing money for years mm -hmm. and they're just like because you yeah. know the, the the bank manager the mutual the fund manager they take their one percent regardless, regardless of if you make if you money, make money or, or lose money they still take that percentage and that's only the management expense ratio is the is the expense that they're charging you for the fund so there are two fund managers that you have when you buy a mutual fund and most people don't know this the first one is the mutual fund manager that's the person that creates the fund and it's usually typically like three or four people that manage that portfolio mm -hmm. that's the person that is 
buying all the companies. And then there's a second fund manager. That's the person you talk to. Mm. That's the person that puts you into the fund and they earn something called a trailing commission. So you get, you get charged a percentage by the actual fund managers and then you get a second percentage, which is a trailing commission. And that commission, you're, you're, they're charging you whether you're making money or I losing know. money. <laughs> I hope everyone heard that. So mm -hmm. what would you say if somebody currently has a mutual fund and they go and check after, the, right? Or maybe they pause this right now and then they go and check <laughs> and then they see that they've been losing money for some time. What would you suggest? Because I know breaking, a, like leaving a mutual fund can also cost you some money. Mm -hmm. So what would you suggest in that situation? What I, and this 100% of my clients that come to me always have a mutual fund. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and what I always like to do is I want to actually see how that mutual fund has been performing. Mm -hmm. Some mutual funds have not been too bad. Some okay. mutual funds, especially if you had it, things like some people have been investing for like 10 years since they were since they started working so you want to see how long you've held that fund because mutual funds are good the only thing is that you're expensive yeah. so if you had a mutual fund back in the day and you have a lot of money in it and it's been doing well even though those fees are high I would say keep it. Okay. I would say keep it but moving forward you want to have your investments in something that would not um take a lot of money because you have to look at what the the stock market was like 10 years ago the stock market five years ago is up 50 yeah. percent you don't want to lose out on that gain that's true just because of the one percent because even if you move it to today but because today we're already at a much higher level as we were five years ten years ago mm -hmm. you're still better off having that fund if it has been performing according yeah. to what his benchmark was doing. So mm -hmm. one of the things when you look at the fund, when you look at the fund name or whatever, under the overview section, they'll tell you the benchmark it's trying to beat or trying to mirror or whatever. So you want to look at that benchmark and see how has this benchmark performed in the last 10 years? Let's say, for example, the benchmark has done 50% return and then yours has done 5%. And clearly, yeah. those people don't know what they're doing. So obviously, this fund has not performed like it was supposed to. Mm -hmm. So you know it's a good time to leave. But if that fund has been doing wow. what it's supposed to do, like at the end of the day, you're looking to make money. Yeah. Keep it. But moving forward, move to something else. And if you've invested maybe the last two, three years, almost guaranteed that that fund did not do anything, <laughs> then you can move it. But you need to be careful with how you do that, mm -hmm. especially if the money is in your RSP. So you want to do what they call um, in an in, yes. Yeah, so you want to do an in-kind transfer where you call, let's say you open an account with Wealth Simple mm -hmm. or Questrade. So as you're opening that account, they will typically ask you, where do you, how do you want to fund your portfolio? Do you want to fund it with cash or do you want to move it from another institution? So you fill out the form. You say you want to do an in-kind transfer. So it will move the funds and the assets as is mm. into your new account. Because what you do, if you sell it and you, some mutual funds, when you sell it, there's all these taxes, but if it's in your RSP, no problem. But if you withdraw it, now you have to pay those taxes yeah. and you lose your contribution room. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to do that. So make sure that if you are going to break this mutual fund and take your money out or take your money out of any platform, like if you mm -hmm. are with TD right now and you want to move to Wealth Simple, you just want to make sure you're doing an in-kind transfer rather than just taking it out and then trying to put it back in another yeah. one. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So I think um, we've spoken about ETFs, index funds, mutual funds. These are all ways that you can start investing. Mm -hmm. What about individual stocks, investing in individual stocks? <laughs> what are your thoughts on this for the average person? And mm -hmm. if, so, yeah, let's start with that. What are your thoughts on this for the average person? Yes or no? Should we do it? Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> it depends. Okay. So there's something that I actually teach, which is the different building blocks of a portfolio. Where do you start when you're starting from scratch? Okay. The first thing you want to do, and I say look at investing like you're building a house. You will not go and buy a couch. Let's say you're building a house from scratch. You will not go and buy a couch when you haven't even broken ground and laid the foundation. That, that does not make sense mm -hmm. because that couch is not a necessity. At that point, you need a foundation before you can even build walls in your house. Mm -hmm. So you need to have a foundation in place. And for me, that foundation is having a broad-based diversified ETF or index fund okay. because that would help whether your portfolio It's what's going to help keep that structure strong. Because if you start out and you invest in just stocks, 
a little swing in the market, a little rain, a little storm, your house is on the floor. Yeah, like 2020. You don't want that. <laughs> like, say 2020 happened. <laughs> Crash. So you need that solid foundation to mm-hmm. start. And you usually start with something that is broad-based. I recommend people do a broad-based Canadian um, total market fund. What's an example of that? Um, VUN is... VCN, sorry. VCN is the Vanguard ETF that invests in the Canadian stock market. Okay. So what you want to look for is anything that says TSX Composite Index. Okay. How many, company, how many companies are in that? I think there are about 250-ish. Okay. And this is like the top companies in Canada. Canada. Okay. And w- okay. Okay. Yeah. Continue before I interject. And then the second one, like I always want to be with that diversification, you want to have one in Canada, one in the U.S. So you want to look for something that invests in the total U.S. market. One can be an S&P 500 mm-hmm. or you can go even broader. There's some that invest in the entire U.S. market. Mm-hmm. An example would be VUN and that's a Vanguard ETF as well that invests in um, the U.S. market. So you either want to look for an S&P 500 index fund and ETF or something that says total U.S. stock market. Perfect. And then... So, okay. And then, so that's the first building block that we have. No, I'm not done. Oh, okay. (laughs) This building block, because it has to be, it has to be solid. Okay. So there are four things that need to be on that foundation. The Canadian, the U.S., and then you want an international. And the reason being is because you have to look at, there are different things that affect different countries. For example, last year, even though the U.S. stock market was getting like 20% crash, the Canadian stock market was not doing that bad. We had like a 5%, sometimes 8%, um crash Mm -hmm. not crash because crashes after 20 percent so you need to have that diversification within different countries because some countries might be doing well because maybe in in the u.s i feel like the u.s there's always something happening like someone shoots someone and then the whole the whole thing goes all right some president tweets something or uh, some ceo says something yeah they're always canceling somebody and it's like the stock market is a lot chaotic so you want to be diversified that way and then international because there are a lot of emerging markets that are coming up Mm -hmm. the um, asia and the pacific so you also want to be invested in broad like in international and then for some people depending on your tolerance you might want to have a broad-based bond there as well mm. so once that's set you want it once that's set you're not gonna just put the cement and walk away right mm-hmm. it has to grow to a certain level so you're not just gonna move after like you've done like one thousand dollars you have to have at least 50k of foundation there like that foundation has to grow for mm-hmm. it to actually make that foundation solid right yeah. so, so which is that which the every two weeks when you get paid you're putting more and more money into just these four putting pouring the cement into your foundation okay perfect love <laughs> keep it. keep laying that foundation until you have something solid mm-hmm. and then you can move to the next step so my next step is actually income and that's what i consider the walls of that building mm-hmm. and income would be something like a dividend etf it could be um a reit REIT is Real Estate Investment Trust, similar to stocks. Instead of investing in companies, it invests in real estate. Mm-hmm. So what that does is that it yields income for your portfolio. For example, if maybe you need to withdraw from your portfolio, but the market is down, and let's say you have 3% of your portfolio coming from dividends, you can actually cash in on those dividends. So you can withdraw 3% without having to sell your portfolio. This is a way that you can protect your portfolio when the market is down, especially when you're getting closer to withdrawing that money, Mm -hmm. because you don't want to be in a situation where the market is down and then you're trying to withdraw your funds. And then it's like, well, we're down a few percentages. (laughs) So having that income, because dividends get paid out regardless whether the company is making money or not because they've made that promise to investors so they have to pay those dividends and so for everyone who doesn't know what is it what would a dividend be or what is a dividend dividend is when a company distributes a part of its profits to its investors so it's more of like a a thank you for investing in the company so when they earn profits they redistribute some of that to its shareholders so it's seen as income for you Mm -hmm. and it's different from the capital and whatever earnings you're making on that money you've already invested Mm -hmm. so let's say when you invest maybe you bought the company at ten dollars and you bought a thousand shares and now the company is making fifteen dollars all of that money is still yours but in addition to that they'll pay you a percentage of your portfolio so they can pay you one percent as dividends two percent Mm-hmm. every quarter annually whatever the cycle is and you get that money as cash in your brokerage account 
Nice. Okay, cool. So, okay, is that, is that the second one? Income. So the second part is income. Now, the third part mm-hmm. is more of like, this is when you have like the paintings. This is what makes the house look nice. Okay. <laughs> now you can start adding your stocks. Mm-hmm. And we're going to talk about the two, the like different types of stocks. Even with stocks, there's levels to this. Yeah, there are definitely levels to <laughs> there's this. There's levels to this. So when you're doing that, you want to go with the tried and trusted and the ones that, these are the OGs. They yes. have been there. They know what they're doing. They've weathered many recessions. They have had all kinds of products out there. Like they've been there, done that. They know exactly what they're doing. These are called like blue chip stocks or value stocks. Mm-hmm. So that's what you want to have at the third layer of this beautiful house that you're building, which is your portfolio. So once that's settled and for the income, I recommend like if we're talking of like a hundred K portfolio, you want to start 50 with the foundation and then 30 with the income. And then the remainder, that's like the addition, the embellishment. So you want to add stocks to that. So value stocks, blue chip. And then when that's done, maybe around another 20K, mm-hmm. then the remaining is like, it's like the, 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 what's the called? The Himalayan lamp that you don't need. The, <laughs> the extra, the extra cushion. Mm-hmm. Like these are things that are nice to have, but you don't need them. Okay. So this is where people start to get into crypto, mm. um, options, trading, commodity, all these <laughs> It's, I'm never going to get there, to All be these things that you don't need, but they're nice to have. No matter how big my portfolio is, I don't think I'll ever be there. I'm not doing options. I'm not doing any of that. And yeah. this is actually dependent on people. Because for some people, they like to have all of these extra nice things in their houses. And some people, they just like to keep things simple. I'm a minimalist. <laughs> so it all depends. And that's for that part, I say keep it at maximum 10%. Mm-hmm. Mine is 5%. Like if I'm doing any extra, extra, it's 5%. Because mm-hmm. you also want to look at... If I have 100K, if I lose $1,000 out of my 100K, am I going to lose sleep? Is it, are you, are you, you're going to feel a little bad, but it's not going to upset you for the rest of the day. You're going to yeah. feel a little bad. If you lose 5000 how are you going to feel? For some people, it's said, hmm, that's a lot of money, but hmm, I, can, I can let that go. Mm-hmm. What if you lose 20K out of your Mm-mm. 100K? Mm-mm. <laughs> You're gonna your stomach your stomach is gonna start to get upset. Yeah. So that's what you have to think about when you start investing in and these are things that I call I call it maximum growth. Mm. So these things have that tendency to really make you a lot of money, but they also have that tendency for you to lose, lose a, a lot, lot of, of money. money. Yeah. So you wanna be very careful when you're mm-hmm. investing in these things. Like, yeah, because I know there's FOMO and all these things, you wanna participate, mm-hmm. but you need to keep it small. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that overview. And if someone wanted to like learn from you, this from you and like get a personalized one-on-one call how would they how would they do that i have a course she has a course (laughs) i have all of these in my course stack my dime blueprint literally go to Mm www.stackmydimeblueprint.com and you have all that information yeah because i actually recommended a lot of my accountability group members to take the course because i'm like i know about investing but honestly it's not something i want to teach at this moment so (laughs) i'm always like go to eduac and then i know like petra came to you Mm -hmm. petra's like building her portfolio it was one of her wins for the year so Mm -hmm. yeah um i think that if you all want to learn more and like actually get help like hands-on help with it then yeah Edward could be the person i also do one-on-ones but i usually say take the course first because it's yeah. so broken down that you can figure this out yeah. and then if you feel like mm, i still don't understand this thing then you can come and do one-on-ones okay so after listening to this i feel like empowered to well yeah. i already invest but like i feel like anyone who listens to this can feel very empowered that it's not as hard as we mm-hmm. think it is but what do you think about financial advisors? Uh, mm-hmm. Because I know that that is a topic that people are like, oh, like I don't have the skills to invest on my own, so I'm going to hire a financial advisor. And I actually interviewed one on my podcast just mm-hmm. so we could get another opinion because I do not use them. Mm-hmm. I don't think I'll ever use a like a AUM, an assets under management uh, financial advisor, mm-hmm. but I still want to interview one to get their take. So what are your thoughts on financial advisors? So I usually say if you... If the one thing that is stopping you from investing is that fear and you feel that hiring a financial advisor, because for me, I would rather you go with a financial advisor than not invest at all. So if you're at that stage where it's just like, I have tried so hard to learn this investing thing and it's not clicking. Mm -hmm. For some people, they just don't have the time. And then the third thing is if you have um, a windfall, a lot of money coming in at the same time and you don't know what to do with it, then go with a financial advisor. If you have 
a big portfolio. Mm -hmm. But if you're starting with your ten dollars per month, one thousand dollars, that's a waste of money. You don't yeah. need a financial advisor. You can literally start on your own. And I think where a lot of people get into the conundrums that they try to do everything at once. They're trying mm -hmm. to do the stall. They're trying to do the ATM. Which one do I go? If you start with the basics, you start with that foundation. By the time you get to 50K, your muscle would have been strong. strong you will know what strong. you're doing. You would have figured out exactly how the market works. And that's kind of why I like structured it that way because it gives you that that muscle building. It's like, okay, now I've built that foundation. I know exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. Now you're like more inclined to learn more. And a lot of people, it's like, the lack of knowledge too is like when you don't know you just feel you can't do it like mm -hmm. imagine your first job when you started you did not you did not know what it is you were doing <laughs> yeah fine. you had no clue but you figured it out mm -hmm. but when you start that's how you learn like you will not learn until you start yeah a lot of the things that i've learned about tweaking my portfolio even your risk tolerance you might think that oh i can afford a 10 percent loss and then the market is like <laughs> oh you only learn once you do right that's how you learn so yeah. when you start eventually you will not have a need for a financial advisor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So I think the most important lesson that you can get from this is that first of all, you don't need to know everything to start mm -hmm. and it's much easier than you think. The, the lesson is to just do it, right? Whatever avenue is yes. going to get you there. We're just, we just need to get there because the value of investing, like, I think it's important to tell everyone that like saving is good. Saving is important. It's mm -hmm. necessary in your overall finances. However, investing allows you to beat inflation. It allows your money to work for you. Mm -hmm. Like Eddie Rick was telling us about dividends, how you're basically pay getting paid to own, own the stock. We're talking about that living that baby girl lifestyle. Yes. Like you're just getting paid for doing nothing, yes. right? Like let's, that's what we want more of. Okay, yes. so now let's let's go more back to you. And you said mm -hmm. you are investing um, for retire. Like basically you have mm -hmm. your retirement plan to retire and do whatever you want. So can you just, just tell us a little bit more about that? Like how do you reach that coast fi financial independence uh, yes, thing? And what is coast FI? Topic. So, okay, first of all, let's talk about financial independence. Financial independence is when you get to a level where the money you make from your assets, you have enough assets that can pay you an annual income basically for the rest of your life. Love it. So you've basically built a portfolio where you can withdraw a certain percentage every year and live your best life and never run out of money. Mm -hmm. So financial independence uses what they call a safe withdrawal rule. Okay. So, and this percentage is 4%. Now there's a lot of controversy about whether 4% is right or not. I usually say tweak it to, if you want to leave more, then you can increase that. So it's, it's, I mean, if you want to have 20 million in your bank account, no one's going to be mad at you. Okay. <laughs> so 4% Let, of what? Let's what not we... argue about semantics here. Yeah. So what's the 4%? Let's... So 4% is basically, so they did this study, um, called this Trinity study where they analyze a portfolio of hundreds of people and they found out that 4% is kind of that sweet spot where if you withdraw 4% of your portfolio, let's say you have a million dollars. So 4% will be 40,000 that you can live on each year Okay. because you have 96% in the market. That money is still earning, uh, okay. it's still growing, it's still earning dividends. So you can continue to withdraw 4%. Let's say you withdraw 4% and then that year you made another maybe 5%. Like your money is still growing because you're Got not it. taking it all at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you can basically continue to live for 30 plus years. And then, so with the 4%, you withdraw 4% of your portfolio every year until basically forever. Mm -hmm. And you want to also look at the life expectancy. So how long am I going to live after retirement is another thing. And how much you need in your portfolio. And then they actually used... A moderate portfolio for this analysis so having around 40 percent in bonds and around 60 percent in equity because that's what's going to be solid if you have like 80 if you have a very aggressive portfolio then you might not make money in the long run mm -hmm. um so that's the that's the study that they did so when you get to financial independence so basically if you know your goal is to have a million dollars and you work towards that once you get to that one million dollars you can retire you can fire your boss oh, wow. and say, I don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about Coastify. Coastify is, and then with financial independence, some people actually prefer to retire early. So rather than waiting to 65, they're like, okay, I already have a um, million dollars at age 30. I can do this, right? Mm -hmm. Depending on you and how the kind of lifestyle you want to live. Then with Coastify, it actually is how much you have 
in your portfolio that if you don't invest any other dollar towards it, you will still have enough to retire. So one of the things that Coastify looks at is it considers your horizon. So the longer you have, the more time that that money is going to grow for you. So let's say you have 150K and you see that your Coastify number tells you you need 150K and then you have 35 years. So if you leave that 150K in the market, in the next 35 years, it will grow to a million dollars because you have time. So that's one of the most important things with Coastify is that the longer time you have, the more you can use the Coastify route. So you can get to Coastify and then go buy a house, live your best life. You can do whatever you want because you know, no matter what, you already have that money invested and it's going to grow mm. and get to that goal when you get to 65. Okay. So Coastify is for people that don't necessarily want to retire early but they want to live their life and enjoy it mm -hmm. while they're making money. So instead of waiting to like, oh, I'm going to like aggressively because with financial independence, retire early, it requires a lot of aggressive saving. Yeah. If you're trying to get to like a million or two million before age 40, that's a lot of money that you're going to be pumping in the market. Yeah. Most people like invest 80% of their income. But for some people, they're like, that's well, <laughs> if I invest 80%, what's going to be left for me? Right like, I want to enjoy my life today. Yes. So with Coastify, you can actually, okay, I still have money for retirement, but I still get to enjoy my life today. Nice. And I like that this is like a, even a movement right now. Mm -hmm. It's like a lot of people may not even know like this is a thing or that, oh, I can retire early. Like a lot of people don't yeah. even think about that or have a work optional life. So uh, if someone wants to like learn more about this Coastify fire movement, how would they do that? Do so I actually have a, a master class coming up on, I don't know when this is going to be released. Yeah. This is probably released before, after. Okay. It's on the 24th of May. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but. Okay, so I have um, a course where I have detailed everything down. Literally everything, every step you can think of when in your vesting journey. Perfect. From how much would you need to retire comfortably? What should you have in your portfolio? We talked about the different stages. Um, if you want to become more advanced, if you want to start investing in stocks, in dividends, what do you actually look for when you're wanting to invest in dividends, mm -hmm. when you're wanting to invest in stocks, and then how do you actually plan your retirement? Because that's one of the things people don't consider. Yeah. Once you've gotten to that fire, how do you exit? Mm. So one of the modules there is exit the rat race. So I actually talk about how you can draw down on your investments. It's called the Stack My Dime Blueprint because we're stacking our dimes <laughs> slowly. Yes. Um, and go to www.stackmydime.com and you can learn everything you need to know about investing. Perfect. I will probably take this course because I'm, I'm on this journey too, okay? I'm excited. Okay, so I know we could talk literally for the next five hours, but I think we should wrap this episode up right now. Yes. Uh, but thank you so much for being here. If My last question for you is, what is one piece of advice that you would give our listeners to make sure they don't go broke trying to invest in the stock market? Keep it simple. Mm -hmm. Don't be trying to do the most start with the foundation stick to the four build your 50k move to the next stage slow and steady wins the race yes i love that so Eric, thank you so much for being here next up we have our coin fashions episode and if anyone follows me on, or the podcast on social media you know that Eduek, you'll see Eduek in the comments <laughs> giving her two cents on the coin fashion so i'm really excited to have a live coin fashions episode with her Eduek, thank you for being here could you plug yourself and let people know where they can find you if they want to connect with you so i'm two sides of a dime everywhere instagram tiktok twitter youtube and my website as well um I have so many. I have a newsletter as well called The Stock, where I it's share really weekly tips on investing, money management. I have a website, my blog. I have so so many things, yes. guys. I know there's so much knowledge, <laughs> so much on information. My brain is just pouring out. <laughs> so if you want to learn, you can go to all of my free information that I have out there. If you want something more tailored to you, I also have a, a coaching. This is more personalized, so it's a private coaching service as well. If you want a course where everything is like outlined for you, I got you too. Mm -hmm. The Stack My Dying Blueprint. So 
Anything you want, I got it. Okay, so thank you so much, everyone, for listening to this episode. I really, 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 really do appreciate you for listening if you got this far. If you did this, get this far, that means you clearly love the podcast. So make sure you subscribe on any platform that you're currently watching or listening to this on. Make sure that you follow both of us and follow the podcast and share this with a friend. So share this on your Instagram story, share it on your Twitter, share it somewhere and tag Eduag, tag the podcast and tag me because it really does help us and again this is amazing knowledge that was shared here and i think that you should not hoard it and keep it all to yourself you should share it with a friend so i really appreciate you for listening and we will see you in the next episode bye